Living in Extremistan, How Exceedance Probability and PML Risk Relate to Planning, Prevention, and Response in Homeland Security by Ted Lewis. This is a story about the death of uniformity and the birth of the long-tail probability distribution. Long-tail distributions are biased. Low-consequence events are much more likely than high-consequence events. This property is reflective of the real world. For example, consumers purchase bits on the Internet in accordance with a long-tail distribution. Similarly, catastrophes like hurricanes, terrorist attacks, and contagions obey a long-tail distribution. In contrast to Pascal's equally likely events model, the long-tail model is better suited to extremistan, Talib's metaphorical world of extreme events. Black Swan incidents obey the long-tail power law. This leads to what insurance company actuaries call the exceedance probability curve. Exceedance curves are more universal and quantifiable measures of vulnerability than simple risk models based on threat, vulnerability, and consequence. As an aside, humans tend to exaggerate their perception of risk. In practice, perceived risk is typically 1,000 times larger than actual risk. Therefore, we must be careful when using mathematics to inform policy. If citizens perceive risk is much higher than actual risk, risk communications based on actual risk may be ineffective. Worse still, decisions made on perceived risk can be completely wrong and wasteful of resources. Talib's extremistan metaphor allows us to classify hazards according to their actual risk. Risk declines with size of consequence in low-risk hazards like terrorism, but increases with size of consequence for high-risk hazards, like the spread of highly contagious diseases. This observation should change how we plan, prevent, and respond to catastrophes. I conclude this lecture with a set of recommendations for living in extremistan. How do you plan for catastrophes? Expect the unexpected. 250 years after Blaise Pascal formulated the mathematics of probability, transforming the mythology of chance into a science, George Kingsley Zipf observed some very unexpected real-world phenomena. Zipf measured the frequency of words in natural languages like English and observed that some words occurred much more often than others. He plotted the rank order of words in common use and obtained a long-tailed distribution shown here. The distribution was named after Zipf, but over the past century, this distribution has been rediscovered by dozens of people. Frank Benford, for example, noticed a similar distribution of leading digits in financial ledgers. Today, Benford's law is used to detect fraud in accounting. If leading digits depart too far from Benford's law, chances are someone has cooked the books. Zipf's law has been discovered so many times by so many people that it is now known by a more general name. Power laws are distributions with a long tail, as shown here. Mathematically, they are simply the inverse of the x-axis raised to some power. Here we see the power law equation as 1 over x raised to the q power. Typically, x will represent consequence and exponent q ranges between 0 and 2 or 3. As it turns out, we can associate exponent q with the risk and resilience of various infrastructure systems. Any probabilistic distribution with a long tail that fits this mathematical equation qualifies as a power law. We soon learn that power laws are found everywhere. About the same time, but in a different part of the world, Wilfredo Pareto was discovering the power law all over again. Only Pareto was into economics. In fact, he is known as the father of mathematical economics. Pareto observed that 80% of wealth is owned by only 20% of the population, hence the 80-20 rule. Pareto attained some political notoriety when fascist Benito Mussolini, Prime Minister of Italy from 1922 to 1943, praised his work. The 80-20 rule still bothers some politicians today. The 80-20 rule is another example of a power law. Only the name comes from the fact that 80% of the area under the long-tailed distribution shown here 
falls under the power law curve within the first 20% of the x-axis. This area is called the head of the distribution. The remaining part of the power law is called the long tail. This formulation of the power law suggests something deeper is going on in nature. Why are so many observed phenomena represented so precisely by a power law? While the exponent may vary for different hazards and different infrastructures, the power law appears to be universal. The size of cities, internet messages, stock returns, sand particles, meteorites, species in nature, forest fires, and casualty losses all obey a power law. In other words, power laws are general models of many everyday systems found in the real world. The reason why power laws turn up in so many places will become obvious later on. In terms of homeland security, hazards, and critical infrastructure, we learn that power laws model the likelihood of catastrophes of all sizes. Power laws give us a way to measure and quantify the likelihood of impending disaster. Power laws have recently achieved superstar status, principally because of the Internet. For example, Chris Anderson's book, The Long Tail, describes how consumer behavior on the Internet obeys a long-tailed distribution. His thesis is that the tail is as important or more important than the head because the Internet makes it easy for people to find and purchase obscure, low-volume products. There are so many people with access to the Internet that long-tailed products have become as profitable as the most popular products. Eric Brynjolfsson and colleagues performed a more scientific study of the long-tail phenomenon and confirmed Anderson's claim. In fact, the researchers found that the power law representing Internet sales was only slightly less extreme than Pareto's estimate, the head accounting for only 72% of consumers who buy 28% of the products offered online. But it reinforces Anderson's claim because more people apparently buy from the tail than expected. This result suggests a slightly lower exponent Q than Pareto obtained but points out the universality of the general power law. A number of books have appeared in print touting the power law. It is a celebrity. What does fascination with the power law mean? In Pascal's world of chance, random events occur with equal likelihood. Dice, coins, and playing cards are assumed to be fair. That is, each face of a die is assumed to appear with equal probability. But in the real world of natural disasters, terrorist attacks, and accidents, the likelihood of an event is biased. Randomness is lopsided. In fact, the lopsidedness of random events often follows a power law. Incidents are skewed toward the low end of the consequence spectrum. Small consequence events are much more likely to occur than large consequence events. Suppose the horizontal axis is consequence and the vertical axis is frequency of an event, such as a hurricane. As shown in the graph, we can count the number of times small, medium, and large hurricanes have occurred over the decades and centuries. These counts are plotted on the vertical axis, corresponding with their size on the horizontal axis. The counts are normalized, so they sum to 100%, which yields a frequency distribution curve. In a biased world of catastrophes, the distribution is lopsided, as shown here. While events appear to be random, they aren't uniformly random. Instead, they are biased toward small events. Fortunately, major events, catastrophes, are rare. Observing this was the genius of Zipf and Pareto. Power laws have attracted the attention of a number of popular writers. Perhaps the most successful writer of power law reality is Nassim Taleb, author of the popular book The Black Swan. Taleb defines a black swan as a rare event with high consequences. We cannot predict black swans, but we can estimate the power law that describes them. Taleb uses the black swan as a metaphor for extreme events, because prior to discovery, black swans were considered impossible. Taleb's writing is about impossible events that happen. Taleb is the latest in a long line of catastrophe theory advocates. Charles Perrault proposed another theory in 1984 and published his Normal Accident Theory in a book of the same title. 
normal accident theory offers one explanation of black swans. Purbach's punctuated equilibrium theory goes even further. Bach is famous for the Sandpile experiment, published in 1987 and revisited in Bach's 1999 book titled How Nature Works. Remarkably, Bach explains why nature is unpredictable, obeys a power law, and why systems eventually build up a kind of criticality called self-organized criticality, SOC, that eventually leads to ruin. Catastrophes are partly the fault of the system itself. These theories will be developed further in subsequent lectures. Black swans, normal accidents, punctuated equilibria, and power laws are all different facets of the same thing. They explain how and why catastrophes happen. For convenience, we will use the term extremistan to describe our world of high-risk hazards and unpredictable catastrophes. Talib distinguishes between two metaphorical worlds. Mediocristan is the normal world ruled by Pascal's triangle. Events obey a normal or bell curve distribution, and likelihood of events tend to the mean value. Extremistan is the extreme, rare event, high consequence, unpredictable world ruled by the power law. Events obey a lopsided long tail distribution. There is no mean value. There are only highly likely insignificant events, rarely punctuated by highly unlikely catastrophic events. The defining rule in extremistan is the exceedance probability distribution that is typically a power law. Exceedance probability represents the likelihood of an event at least as big as some specified consequence. Risk in extremistan is simply the product of the power law probability times consequence. Insurers call this probable maximum loss, or PML risk. A simple way to think of PML risk is this. Multiply the long tail exceedance probability y-axis times the x-axis to get risk. The blue line represents PML risk above. For example, assume we want to estimate the risk of an incident with consequence equal to 120. The exceedance probability at x equals 120 is 26.4%, say. Multiplication of 120 by 26.4% gives 31.7 as the PML risk. PML risk is in the same units as consequence. 31.7 might represent financial consequences in millions of dollars, casualties in lives, area burned in a forest fire, or barrels of oil spilled in an oil drilling accident. The power law is very useful because it compactly represents both likelihood and risk. Given consequence, we can estimate both likelihood and risk. More on this next. These ideas and concepts can be illustrated by a simple example taken from telephone service data collected during the 1990s. This is illustrative of past experience only because this sector has radically changed since the Telecommunications Act of 1996. The frequency of service outages is shown in this graph as data points connected by a dotted line. Each outage results in a consequence measured by million minutes of loss of service. For example, 30% of the outages resulted in 30 million minutes of lost service, and 20% resulted in 120 million minutes of outage. To determine the PML risk to this sector, we need to do some simple arithmetic. First, convert the frequency data into an exceedance probability curve, and second, multiply exceedance probability by consequence to obtain risk. Step 1. Convert the frequency data into an exceedance probability curve. We do this by summing from the right-hand side of the graph towards its origin for each data point. For example, to compute the exceedance probability at consequence equal to 120, add together the frequency data points at 150, 140, 130, and 120, as shown here. In this case, we get EP120 equal to 26.4%. Step 2. To obtain PML risk, multiply the exceedance probability by consequence. For example, to get the PML risk of an outage of 120 million minutes or more, multiply EP120 times 120. 
In this case, we get 31.7 million minutes. Does this exceedance probability fit a power law? The exceedance probability curve is typically a power law, as shown here. In this example, the solid line represents an ideal power law with an exponent q equals 0 0.91. While the fit is not exceptional, it is reasonable given the limited data. The telecom sector of the 1990s belongs to Extremistan because its likelihood of outage obeys a power law and the slope q of the power law is less than 1. Why does the slope or exponent of the power law matter? What about its risk profile? The result of multiplying vertical axis by horizontal axis is the PML risk curve, shown here as a solid line. In the plot, PML risk is divided by 100, so it can be compared with frequency and exceedance probability. Thus, we call this a risk profile. Notice that risk generally increases as consequence increases. This is a high risk hazard because the risk curve trends upward. If it trended downward with consequence, we would call it a low risk hazard. Therefore, the slope of the power law, its exponent, equates with risk. A high value of the slope or exponent corresponds with the resilient system, while a low value signifies less resilience. The risk profile shown here suggests that telecom in the 1990s was indeed from Extremistan. Extreme outages occurred more often than a telecom system in mediocristan should. The slope or exponent, Q, is an easy and fast way to determine resiliency. Any system with Q less than 1 is high risk of low resilience and therefore belongs to extremistan. A second example illustrates the generality of the power law model. Consider floods as a major hazard. Do floods occur in extremistan? Some of the worst floods in U.S. history occurred in the 20th century. The Great Flood of 1927 flooded 27,000 square miles with up to 30 feet of Mississippi River water. 700,000 people were displaced and 246 people died. In terms of $2,005, the Great Flood caused $5 billion in damage and led to a number of popular songs about the disaster. More recently, the flooding of New Orleans precipitated by Hurricane Katrina submerged 80% of New Orleans under 20 feet of water. 1,464 people died, and hundreds of thousands were displaced. In $2,005, this catastrophe cost $81 billion, over 10 times as much as the 1927 flood. These are big events, but they are also extremely rare. Do they belong to Extremistan? What is the shape of the exceedance probability for large floods? Applying our newly acquired expertise to historical data on large floods leads us to conclude that large-scale floods are from mediocristan. Why? Note that the exceedance probability rapidly declines with consequence. In terms of water volume, likelihood of major flooding declines rapidly with a power law exponent of approximately 1.75. Thus, the risk profile decreases with increases in consequences, leading us to conclude that large floods are low-risk hazards. Surprised? In general, any hazard with an exponent greater than 1.0 implies a low-risk hazard. This result may surprise you because large floods are horrendous. But risk is not consequence. Risk is not vulnerability either, and humans tend to overestimate risk, especially when consequences are high. But let us be unemotional. PML risk is the product of likelihood times consequence. If the likelihood, expressed as exceedance probability, rapidly drops with consequence, risk does too. The foregoing provides a framework for a general theory of hazards based on exceedance probability, power laws, and risk profiles. Exceedance probability may seem esoteric and too mathematical for comprehension, but it is actually a very simple statement of fact. Accidents, attacks, and natural disasters occur somewhat erratically, but the bigger the consequence, 
the less likely the incident will occur. That is, big earthquakes, disastrous hurricanes, large fires, and major accidents, such as the Three Mile Island nuclear power meltdown, occur much less often than small earthquakes, small hurricanes, small fires, and traffic accidents. Likelihood rapidly declines as consequence increases. So incidents and their consequences are not really erratic, but instead obey similar exceedance probability curves. Small incidents are rather frequent. Extremely large incidents are very rare. The probability of a small meteor hitting the Earth is rather high but the probability of an asteroid equal to or greater than the size of the KT event meteor that wiped out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago is very slight. Exceedance probability rapidly declines along the x-axis, representing consequence, as shown by the second picture. As consequence goes up, exceedance probability drops dramatically. Exceedance probability is not the same as frequency of occurrence or how often an event of similar size has occurred in the past. Exceedance probability is the sum total of all frequencies of a certain size or larger occurring over some period of time. That is, exceedance probability of an incident of a certain size x is the frequency of an incident of size x plus x plus 1 plus x plus 2 plus x plus 3 and so on, up to the frequency of the largest possible incident. Exceedance probability owes its name to the fact that it measures the likelihood of all events that exceed a certain size. Exceedance probability is used by the insurance industry to estimate probable maximum loss, or PML risk, which in turn is necessary to estimate insurance premiums. For more on this topic, read the book by Grossi and Kunreuther, published in 2005. Exceedance probability typically follows a power law. As it turns out, most hazards obey an exceedance probability curve that is also a power law. Zip and Pareto had it right. Let's get a bit more formal. Formally, PML risk is defined as consequence C raised to the 1Q power. Note that the product of a power law times consequence yields another power law. The question is, does PML risk increase or decrease as C increases? It depends on the value of exponent Q. If Q is greater than 1, the PML risk curve rises briefly and then goes to 0 as consequence goes to infinity. This is illustrated by the lower curve in the graph. If Q is less than 1, the PML risk curve rises slowly and continues to increase as consequence increases. Thus, risk increases without bound as consequence goes to infinity. This is illustrated by the upper curve in the graph, which is the curve obtained for the telecommunications outages example. In general, we can classify hazards according to the value of exponent Q as follows. If Q is greater than 1, the asset threat pair is considered low risk. If Q is less than 1, the asset threat pair is considered high risk. If Q equals 1, the asset risk pair is on the fence between high and low. I arbitrarily put these into the high risk classification. Does this theory model reality? As it turns out, it does. Most hazards of interest to Homeland Security follow exceedance probability curves that fit a power law. Here is a table of hazards considered high risk because their exponent, Q, is less than 1. This means that each high risk hazard in this table has a risk profile that increases as consequence increases. Theoretically, PML risk goes up forever. In reality, all PML risk curves eventually drop to zero, but not before rising. This data was collected from a number of sources, as shown. For details, consult the source cited here. In summary, 1. Most hazards of interest to Homeland Security have exceedance probabilities that obey a power law. Big incidents are magnified versions of small incidents. Furthermore, big incidents are rare. 2. The exponent of the power law determines the risk profile of each hazard and places it in one of two classes low or high risk. 3. 
Consequences are measured in different ways, but the units of consequence measurement have no effect. Risk is still either low or high, depending on Q. 4. Regardless of type of hazard, exceedance probabilities consistently obey a power law, but with different exponents. This is a rather striking set of observations. How might they affect policy? This table lists some common low-risk hazards. While the definitions of consequence differ from hazard to hazard, the fact that these are low-risk hazards may come as a shock. For example, terrorism is considered low-risk. Classification hinges on the exponent of the power law that defines exceedance probability. The key observations here are, one, Hazards in this classification have little in common other than the fact that their exceedance probability curves all obey a power law. Two, natural disasters such as fires and floods and human-made attacks such as terrorism and accidents such as airline crashes all behave alike in terms of PML risk. Be careful, however, not to generalize too much. Not all hazards obey a power law. Car accidents, for example, do not. Once again, the conclusions implied here make one ask, what strategy should be applied in each case? Let me summarize the comprehensive model of hazards we have developed so far. The chart shown here combines Bach's punctuated equilibrium model and Taleb's extremistan model. The vertical part of this flow diagram describes mediocristan, while the horizontal flow diagram describes extremistan. Infrastructure systems work perfectly well most of the time. When something happens, it typically qualifies as a normal accident, as described by Perot. Normal accidents most often require small adaptations, such as fixing a transmission line, adding capacity, or performing repairs. The Exxon Valdez incident illustrates a natural hazard, and the Oklahoma City bombing illustrates a terrorist attack incident. While these are horrible events, they do not lead to major adaptations. The mediocristan feedback typically increases self-organized criticality, SOC. SOC is typically a byproduct of repairs, performance enhancements, optimizations, etc. In fact, Bach argues that SOC is inevitable because it is a consequence of optimization, especially to achieve greater performance at lower cost. Thus, we innocently drive infrastructure systems toward the precipice of disaster. On the other hand, rarely does a large incident, a black swan, occur that leads to a major adaptation. Black swans are tripped by some major event, such as the 9-11 terrorist attacks or the 2008 financial meltdown. According to Bach, consequences are greatly magnified by SOC. So, one way to mitigate black swan consequences is to reduce SOC. Black swans are huge. They have led to extinctions of some species, including the near extinction of the human race 74,000 years ago, when the Tobu volcano erupted and left Lake Tobu behind. Theoretically, the dinosaurs were wiped out 65 million years ago by a black swan event. Black swans are followed by chaotic adaptation, even mutations of entire species. The chaos following 9-11 is still reverberating in the U.S. The Patriot Act and financial regulation following 9-11 and the financial meltdown of 2008 are obvious examples of chaotic adaptation following a black swan. Chaotic adaptation takes decades to dissipate. The fall of the former Soviet Union is still sending ripples throughout the world. Nobody can predict how long the world will have to live with terrorism. Punctuated equilibrium, normal accident theory, and extremistan are models of the world we live in. Critical infrastructure protection is just one instance of the challenge we face. The theory put forth here provides a rational framework for planning, resource allocation, and decision-making under uncertainty. How does one plan in extremistan? I propose three major guidelines for the planner. One, expect the unexpected. SOC is constantly increasing in almost all modern infrastructure systems, organizations, and society in general. 
as systems reach critical states, they become susceptible to normal accidents. Mathematically, exceedance probability curves flatten out as SOC rises. This means that many infrastructure systems evolve over time from low to high risk systems. Optimization of performance is typically responsible for this evolution. If we want to lower risk, we have to lower SOC. 2. A dual mode strategy is called for. Response capacity is needed to address low risk hazards because this class of hazards occurs frequently but suffers less severe consequences. Low risk means the resilient exponent, Q, is equal to or greater than 1. Terrorism and most floods are low risk. 3. Prevention is expensive, and so it should be applied to high-risk hazards, because they are extremely rare. But when they happen, consequences are huge. The power law exponent, Q, is less than 1 for this class of hazards. Examples are wars and epidemics. These three simple rules are extremely operational. It doesn't take much to recognize self-organized criticality in infrastructure systems. The challenge is in implementation. SOC reduction is not economically attractive because it lowers productivity and profitability. Yet, it is better to understand why systems fail than to ignore the causes. The policy implications of extremistan are simple. If we believe in risk-informed decision-making as opposed to politically motivated resource allocation, then we should use these models to minimize risk in such a way that we realize a high return on investment, ROI. Risk minimization alone is not prudent. Policies that spend money to reduce risk alone may produce poor results because some hazards cost too much to mitigate. Second, risk analysis is typically applied to single assets, such as buildings, dams, power plants, and oil wells. A better strategy is system-oriented analysis, typically involving measurement of the power law exponent, which we call resilience. While resilience is multidimensional, the power law exponent is a simple metric that captures system-level properties relating to system risk and resilience. Hence, we recommend the exponent Q be used in resource allocation decisions. Invest to reduce the power law exponent. Third, resilience-informed analysis requires an awareness of SOC. Decreases in SOC result in increases of resiliency and lowering of risk. The enemy of resilience is SOC. Finally, broad strategies based on classification of hazards as either low or high risk can result in better allocation of resources. Hazards belonging to extremistan should be prioritized over hazards in mediocristan. In extremistan, resources are put into expanding intelligence operations, asset hardening, component redundancy, system surge capacity, and reduced operating levels in critical systems, such as the electric power grid. In mediocristan, resources are put into capability to respond, more fire engines, training, and stockpiles of response assets, such as vaccines. Response requires planning, coordination of agencies across jurisdictions, and collaboration. This also requires information sharing at levels beyond current practice. Policy should be informed by good science. The science of catastrophes is well understood but often not applied to the challenge of critical infrastructure protection. We need to change our ad hoc approach and apply already well-known principles to the challenge of preventing and responding to catastrophes.